the October meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good morning to everyone. Thank you to everyone who is joining us in the boardroom and via live stream today. Let's turn right now to our business. The first item of business is the recognition of two newly named Regents professors. Interim President Ettinger, would you please join me at the podium? exceptional contributions to the university through teaching, research, scholarship, or creative work, and contributions to the public good. From the inception of the Regents Professorship Program, the University of Minnesota Foundation has underwritten a stipend for each Regents Professor. The stipend is currently $50,000 annually, with $20,000 dedicated to a salary augmentation and $30,000 dedicated to a discretionary research fund. This is an indication of the critical importance the University of Minnesota Foundation attaches to the program. It is my honor now to introduce you to, we actually have three newly appointed Regents professors, but one's not able to be here today. But I will start with that because we definitely want to recognize her. This is Professor Jean O'Brien, who's not able to be with us this morning. Jean O'Brien is a distinguished McKnight professor in the Department of History in the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities <laughs> campus. Professor O'Brien is a historian of indigenous peoples whose research and publications are reshaping the fields of Native American and indigenous history. Her achievements have earned her the highest accolades from many established historical organizations, including the American Antiquarian <laughs> Association, the Society of American Historians, and most recently, membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among her many honors, Professor O'Brien received the American Indian History Lifetime Achievement Award from the Western History Association in 2014. In 2013, she co-founded a journal published at the University of Minnesota that has gained an international reputation. Native American and Indigenous Studies is the name of the publication, and it promotes new scholarship from around the world. The journal has a stellar reputation that supports the work of students, professors, and Indigenous intellectuals. Professor O'Brien has also created opportunities for new scholarship and consciously rejects barriers to inclusion based on rank, prestige, or disciplinary background. Professor O'Brien's teaching has garnered her awards, including the Outstanding Contributions to Post-Baccalaureate, Graduate, and Professional Education Award from the University of Minnesota in 2006, and the Richard A. Yarborough Mentoring Award from the American Studies Association in 2022. She was elected to the Academy of Distinguished Teachers in 2006. Professor O'Brien has chaired two other departments and was also a member of the organizing committee for Keeping Our Faculty of Color Symposium in multiple years. She served on the advisory committees for the Bush Faculty Development Program and also the Committee for Mentoring Women Faculty. She was also instrumental in the formation of Race, Indigeneity, Disability, Gender, and Sexuality Center and was the driving force in building the Ojibwe Language Program into a full-fledged major that has become a model for other universities in North America. Her dedicated and transformative work helped to create the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association, which brings US-based scholars together with indigenous scholars from around the globe, and which expands the research and institutional space, allowing indigenous students to thrive. As a white earth band of Ojibwe tribal member, and as one of the preeminent indigenous academic leaders globally, O'Brien has also dedicated significant efforts to building an institution that is more responsive and responsible to the Native community on varied issues, including wild rice research in Minnesota and sports mascots. Please join me in congratulating Professor O'Brien.
Next, we will honor Sarah Hobby. Professor Hobby, will you please join us at the podium? <coughs> Sarah Hobby is a distinguished McKnight University professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and the Behavior in College of Bi and Behavior in the College of Bi Biological Sciences on the Twin Cities campus. Her contributions to the University of Minnesota have transformed the ecological research landscape at the university and regionally. Her successful efforts to fund the infrastructure associated with this important long-term research program have created an architecture to sustain this work for decades to come. Professor Hobby was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2013, and she is a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Ecological Society of America. She has over 220 peer-reviewed publications and regularly publishes in high-impact journals such as Science and Nature. During her tenure, Professor Hobby has received $49.3 million in external funding as either the lead or co-PI from the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Professor Hobby's scholarly work has shaped how we understand human impacts on ecosystems. She considers how human, human social, economic, and political layers shape ecological cycles, how these cycles interact, and what this means for the services that ecosystems provide. Her research has implications for conservation of biodiversity, climate change management, and equitable access to ecosystem services. Professor Hobby uses long-term experiments to tease apart the effects of human activities on ecosystem cycles. She uses ecological frameworks to understand urban ecosystems and their impacts on human well-being, and has made critical contributions to the growing field of urban ecology. She has served the university at the departmental, collegiate, and university level on numerous committees including as Director of Graduate Admissions and Director of Graduate Studies in the Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior Graduate Program, as a Department Faculty li Liaison to the Writing Enriched Curriculum Program, and as a member of the Provost Grand Challenges Committee under former Provost Karen Hansen. Hobby has provided editorial <coughs> services to three journals, including the prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and the Annual Review of Ecology, Evolution, and Systematics. She has also served as a member of the Ecological Society of America for two years and was appointed a chair, as chair of their Fellows and Early Career Fellows Selection Committee. In addition, Hobby has contributed long-term service to the Leopold Leadership Program, a leadership development program for mid-career faculty that equips academic researchers with the skills, approaches, and theoretical framework for catalyzing change to address the world's most pressing sustainability challenges. Please join me in congratulating her on her latest achievement, becoming a Regents Professor. Our third and final honoree is Professor Diane Newmark Steiner. Will you please join us at the podium as well? Yeah. 
Diane Newmark Steiner is a professor and head of the School of Public Health, Divisions of Epidemiology and the Community Health on the Twin Cities campus. No? How long ago? July. July. Okay. She was. <laughs> but I didn't and, for nearly. And I'm sure she did a great job at it. No. Yes. <laughs> She is, she is an esteemed researcher and world-renowned scholar whose innovative, accomplished, and exemplary work has transformed our collective understanding of eating, activity, and weight-related health in young people, helping them to set them on a path to healthy lifestyles. Professor Newmark Steiner is committed to sharing her research finding with the public and ensuring that her work continues to positively impact public health through clinical practice, school programming, and policy. She joined the School of Public Health as an assistant professor in 1995, was promoted to tenured associate professor in 1999, and full professor in 2004. She is the recipient of several university awards, including the Distinguished Women Scholars Award and the Outstanding Faculty Award for Excellence in Postdoctoral Advising. She is a member of the Academy for Excellence in Health Research and was named a McKnight Presidential Professor in 2022, excuse me, 2020. Professor Newmark Schneider's scientific work has broken new ground across the globe in several areas of study, including adolescent and young adult nutrition and health, the intergenerational transmission of eating, activity patterns and weight-related outcomes, and the prevention of eating disorders and obesity. Her research has shaped and is cited in the federal dietary guidelines for not only the United States, but also Australia and New Zealand. And she is referenced by many non-governmental organizations, including the World Health Organization and medical associations in the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and Mexico. In 1997, Newmark Steiner established what has become the world's largest and most comprehensive longitudinal, longitudinal body of research examining patterns and predictors of eating, activity, and weight-related health in young people. This is the ongoing and groundbreaking project EAT, e Eating and Activity Among Teens and Young Adults. To date, Project EAT has collected 20 years of follow-up data, uh, data on two diverse cohorts during the transition from adolescence to adulthood. The School of Public Health appointed Professor Newmark Steiner head of the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health in 2015, and under her leadership, the division holds the second largest research portfolio among all departments at the university, with an annual research expenditure of approximately $25 million. Please join me in congratulating Professor Newmark Steiner for this fabulous award.
Well, if anything reminds us of what we're in the business of doing, it's honoring professors as we've just honored. That really brings home how important our mission is and how important our faculty is, critical to this institution's accomplishment of its mission. This is what just, I think it's all the reason that all of us are on the board when we hear these kind of accomplishments and contributions. So congratulations to all of our uh, region's professors. All right, uh, with that, we will now move to approval of the minutes. Our first item is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Next, we will hear the report of interim president, interim president Ettinger. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I'll start by highlighting a few of the activities and visits that were my good fortune to have over the past month. First of all, it was exciting to be involved with homecoming activities here on the Twin Cities campus the last week of September. I had a chance to participate in the student blood drive on Wednesday, spoke at the alumni awards event on Thursday evening, was part of the royal coronation at Skyu Mania on Saturday morning, yep. and witnessed the Gopher football victory against Louisiana on what turned out to be a hot fall afternoon. Homecoming both here in the Twin Cities and at our greater Minnesota campuses is a great reminder of what the University of Minnesota means to our many proud alumni. Last week I had the opportunity to join leaders across the Twin Cities campus as part of the Provost Fall Leadership Forum. It was a great event organized by Provost Croson, and I found it very fulfilling to be able to interact with over 200 campus and collegiate leaders. I also spent the day last Friday in Rochester meeting with Chancellor Carroll and her leadership team, touring our unique and evolving UMR campus, and interacting with faculty, students, and community leaders. I even attended a highly interactive chemistry class, and I was very grateful that they didn't ask to see my work on the assignment. <laughs> <laughs> we had the opportunity to have lunch in the new dining center. It just opened that day, and it's aptly named The Perch, which given that Rocky the Raptor is, is the mascot for UMR, The Perch is perfect, and it was its first day of operations. It is located in the Student Life Center, which has been successfully converted into a residential hall from a former hotel on Broadway there in Rochester. The food was excellent and the students were thrilled to have this new resource. I remain excited about the future of UMR and our presence in Rochester in cooperation with civic partners. Next, I'd like to give a brief update regarding the health sciences area. We were excited to learn about university representation on Governor Walz's task force to help determine the future of our academic health mission at the U. We appreciate the appointments and service of Regent Penny Wheeler, who is the retired CEO of Alina Health, Dr. Jacob Tolar, our Vice President for Clinical Affairs and Dean of our Medical School, and Connie Delaney, the Dean of the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. The task force met for the first time last Thursday, and a week ago Thursday, and again just this Wednesday, with upcoming meetings scheduled over the coming months. As a reminder, a written summary of these recommendations is due to the governor in January of 2024. We will also continue to keep you updated as further progress is made in our discussions with Fairview and through the task force. I'll turn now to the data incident that we've talked with the board about in the past over the past few weeks. So to recap, in July, we learned that an individual claimed to have posted online certain information from a university database. We engaged internal and external forensic professionals in an investigation to assess the validity of these claims and also work with law enforcement agencies, both locally and the FBI. The investigation revealed that a person likely did gain unauthorized access to a university database in 2021. Based on the university's investigation, the incident potentially affected individuals who submitted information as a prospective student, attended the university as a student, worked at the university as an employee, or participated in university programs between 1989 and August of 2021. In late September, the university began sending emails to individuals who may have been affected. We are offering these individuals the ability to enroll in 12 months of free identity monitoring services 
provided through a third party contractor that specializes in these type of incidents. The university has also been responding to, responding to messages from people requesting further information about the dad incident and the use response. Since 2021, the university has taken steps to bolster its overall secu system security, including by reducing the number of people authorized to access sensitive information, expanding multi-factor authentication, and increasing monitoring for suspicious activities. We take the security of information very seriously, and we regret any worry or inconvenience that this incident may have caused. I'll now switch to the search for the UMD Chancellor. We have launched that search up in Duluth. My personal thanks to Lori Carroll, who is the Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Rochester, and Lisa Irwin, who is UMD's Vice Chancellor for Student Life and the Dean of Students, who have agreed to serve as co-chairs of the search committee. We have finalized the search committee membership and will be announcing the name soon. As a next step in the process, the search committee will hold a series of listening sessions in early November. I'd like to talk for a moment about freedom of expression and diversity of thought as they pertain to two events on campus. The recent appearance by Congresswoman Liz Cheney at the Distinguished Carlson Lecture Series and the interview of Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett by former Dean Stein that is on this coming Monday both in Northrop Auditorium on the Twin Cities campus. At the University of Minnesota, we take pride in our mission of education, research, and community engagement. We are a community that values both the pursuit of knowledge and the exchange of ideas as fundamental pillars in our society. Despite some opposition to these appearances by some in our community, which itself is a freedom of expression, it is important that we offer a forum for diverse voices to be heard. As Interim Law School Dean William McEverin said in an article recently, as a law school, it is valuable for our students to be able to hear directly from one of the nine most important jurists in our country. These are useful learning experiences for all of us, and I'm grateful to the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and the law school for hosting these conversations. During these last two meetings, you become familiar with the university's six-year capital plan and the 2024 capital request. Well, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to celebrate the fruits of our prior capital planning processes and on some of the regions were there as well. And, we, and also celebrate some supportive funding we received from the Minnesota legislature at the project kickoff of the new chemistry undergraduate teaching facility. It was an exciting occasion that attracted significant media attention and featured a bipartisan group of leaders from our state government. The renovated building and its 18 new labs will support a world-class education for 5,000 students each year. Nearly a third of all undergraduates on the Twin Cities campus take class, will take classes in those new chemistry labs. It will put us on the leading edge of instruction, sustainability, and safety. Speaking of safety, ensuring the safety of our community continues to be a top priority for my team. Thanks again to state investment, the University of Minnesota has been able to accelerate projects throughout all our campuses to maintain and replace security equipment. From the new turnstiles at Pioneer Hall on the Twin Cities campus to controlling access to our campus buildings, we have given students an array of safety resources and have heard a great deal of positive feedback. Next week, I will be participating in a campus safety walk and meeting with community members committed to campus safety. Uh, at our prior meeting, Regent Farnsworth mentioned that, that the desire potentially of some regions to be part of safety walks. And so if you're looking for one that I'm involved with, that'll be next Thursday night and you're welcome to join me. I remain thankful to Chief Clark's leadership and for the tireless, tireless efforts of UMPD in keeping our students, faculty, staff, visitors, and guests safe. Over the last several days, we've watched the devastating and ongoing violence in Israel, Gaza, and the surrounding regions. We recognize that this conflict touches the lives of many in our university community, especially those who have connections to both Israel, Israeli and Palestinian communities. Regardless of an individual's position on the long-standing conflict in the region, there is no justification for acts of terrorism. We have joined many others in condemning the abhorrent acts committed by Hamas. We are also saddened by the potential for future escalation of violence in the region. 
As this crisis unfolds, we have encouraged our community to seek out support through mental health services offered on all of our campuses. And importantly, we have also urged everyone to report any incidents of bias. Lastly, I'll provide a brief update on our efforts to improve relationships with outside constituents, the focus of our board's special committee on university relations. Our new executive director of government and community relations, Melissa Lopez Franson, presented earlier today her vision for the department and for the legislative and community engagement over the coming year. Melissa has a broad, bipartisan, and intentional plan that will fully engage the university with our constituents in the community, in Minnesota, and nationally. As we previewed last month, our Dear Minnesota marketing campaign has hit the airwaves as well as the digital space. Hopefully you've seen some or all of these seven videos featuring students or faculty from all five of our campuses. So far, we're hearing great reports about how the campaign is resonating with Minnesotans. Visitors to the Dear Minnesota website are engaging deeply with the stories and we're here receiving submissions from Minnesotans who have visited the site about how the University of Minnesota has made their lives better. This concludes my report. Thank you very much, Chair Mayron. Thank you, Interim President Ettinger. Turning to my report, I'd like to share updates on the board's engagement. Following the September board meeting, several regents visited the St. Paul portion of the Twin Cities campus to meet with leaders from CFANS and CCAPS. This visit is part of onboarding for new regents and each visit opportunity has been extended to the full board. Regents also visited the Crookston and Morris campuses, which included meeting with faculty, staff, and students learning about student research and touring facilities. My board colleagues and I extend our gratitude to everyone across the system who aided in the planning of these engaging visits. Next, I'd like to share that this is our second in a series of five regular board meetings where comments received through the pilot program of the board's virtual forum are included in the docket materials. I believe I can speak for my colleagues in sharing that we value the input from the members of the university community and look forward to continuing through the remainder of the pilot program. As you likely saw, a system-wide message was sent last week that shared information about the Presidential Search Advisory Committee whose members will be appointed in charge later today, and the various listening sessions that will occur across the system starting next week. I encourage all of you, all interested persons, to attend a listening session to provide your input to the committee as they work to finalize a position profile that will be used to recruit the 18th president of the University of Minnesota. Full information about the listening sessions is also available on the search site at president-search.umn.edu. Alternatively, if interested persons are unable to attend an in-person session, the committee and the board would appreciate your feedback via the board's virtual forum by direct mail to pres-search.umn.edu or pro by providing input directly to the search firm. Information about how to provide this feedback is also on the search website. And finally, I'll note that this is the second meeting at which are two new special committee held meetings. Both special committees are engaging with important topics covering consequential issues. I would encourage all of my colleagues to take the time to review the docket materials and to watch the video recordings of those special committees and the committees that you are not a member of in order to ensure that all of us are tracking important issues as they move forward. That concludes my comments and we will now continue with the agenda. The next item is item number five and that is to receive and file reports. Please note those items reported in the docket materials. <coughs> the next item is we will consider the consent report. The consent report includes two items, gifts and nominations to the University of Minnesota Foundation Board of Trustees. Before I invite a motion to approve the consent report, are there any questions, comments, or requests to separate an item out? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the consent report? So approved. Second. Thank you. 
Any discussion on the consent report? <clears throat> There being no discussion on the consent report, all those in favor of approving the consent report, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. <coughs> the next item on the agenda is to appoint and charge the Presidential Search Advisory Committee. This is a key milestone in the presidential search process as the advisory committee will evaluate and narrow the field of presidential candidates to a small number of lead candidates for board consideration. The slate of proposed appointees includes representatives from the Board of Regents, faculty, students, staff, alumni, and the broader university and Minnesota communities. We sought to engage the entire university committee by soliciting nominations for the advisory committee. And by when I say we, that is the chair of the presidential search committee, Regent Davenport, myself, Regent Hipsch, and Regent Kenyanya as leadership on the Board of Regents. We were very impressed when nearly 200 individuals were nominated for this very important role. Thank you to each person who took the time to submit a nomination and thank you all who were willing to be considered for this very important role. Regents Hipsch, Kenyanya, Davenport and I strove to recommend an advisory committee that reflects the breadth and diversity of the university committee, community, including, as I said, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members. We have a group that we're proud to bring before you today. They are remarkable, they are energetic, and they are ready to serve. After the membership list became public, we received much positive feedback about the individuals who have been tapped to serve on this committee. Likewise, we received feedback from some individuals or groups who were disappointed that the proposed committee did not include more representatives of a particular campus, college, or other constituency. We acknowledge such disappointment and note that we have worked very hard to meet all those expectations while also keeping the committee to a size that will allow it to work productively together. I would also like to add that input into the search process is not limited to representation on the advisory committee. As mentioned in my chair's report, the advisory committee looks forward to hearing from members of the university community at the various listening sessions being held across the system. Search advisory committee chair Davenport <coughs> will participate in all of the listening sessions along with consultants from the search firm and presumably and hopefully uh, members of the, one or more members of the search advisory committee. In addition, Regent Davenport is meeting with many other key stakeholders on our campuses in the community and at the state legislature to gain their input. We look forward to hearing the breadth of perspectives and voices. Board leadership is excited about all 24 faculty, staff, students, alumni, regents, and community members who have agreed to serve the university through their time and effort on this advisory committee. They are accomplished individuals who have deep and varied connections to the university and state. I encourage each member of the community, and I know my colleagues have already done that, to review the biographies and the docket materials. This is a very impressive group. I also want to express my gratitude and the board's gratitude to each for their willingness to serve in this capacity. It is a very large time commitment with deeply consequential work. Additionally, a special thank you to our advisory committee chair, Mary Davenport, who has already been working many, many, many hours <laughs> in this capacity and will continue to do so until the advisory committee's work is concluded. Now I would like to turn to the charge. The docket outlines this in detail, but essentially the advisory committee's job is to broadly engage the university community, recruit presidential candidates, and narrow the field to two to four lead candidates for the board to consider. Each member of the committee is expected to be fully engaged in the work 
and to maintain strict confidentiality regarding applicant names and data. And with that, let me say again that with both the advisory committee membership and the charge, we, your board leader, leadership, have been thoughtful and thorough. This is a consequential moment for our university and I ask for your support to move this search forward. Now I will entertain a motion and a second to approve the Presidential Search Advisory Committee membership and charge as outlined in the docket materials. Is there someone who would make that motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. At this time, we'll open this up for discussion. I would like to call on Regent Mary Davenport, the chair of the advisory committee, to speak first. Well, thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, I'd like to underscore some points that you made in your comments. And I want to say that we were very pleased to receive so many nominations for the Presidential Search Advisory Committee. But it did make it very difficult to narrow down the list to the one that you have in front of you today. Having spoken to each individual, I can assure you that each is committed to the university and to the search process, that they take their charge very seriously, and they are eager to hear input from our faculty, staff, students, alumni, and communities across the state in the listening sessions uh, across the system that begin next week. I want to just say that during my career in higher education, I've been involved in hiring many campus and system level leaders. I've been hired as a campus or system level <laughs> leader um, and for various positions. But with that experience and perspective, I can say I am confident in the process and the individuals you will um, hopefully confirm today. I'm interested in hearing other comments that you all have, so I'll close just by saying that I strongly support the Search Advisory Committee membership and the charge that is before us. Thank you all. Further discussion? Yes, Regent Verhalen. I just wanted to take a moment, thank you, Chair Mehran, to express my gratitude to committee chair Davenport, um, to you, Chair Mehran, Vice Chairs Hipsch and Kenyanya. 200 applicants is a lot to go through. And if everyone who wanted to be on this committee was on this committee, you would have a committee of 200 <laughs> people and probably more. Um, because I know there were some people who unfortunately missed the application deadline, so it would be even larger. Which, to your point, would be a bit unwieldy. Um, and so we received several comments through the portal um, of individuals, like you said, who were disappointed that there wasn't more representation from one group or another. And I think it's so important that the university community recognizes that these listening sessions are going to educate and inform the entire process, but then also each of the committee members who are going to participate in them. The committee members' names are all public. <laughs> Just putting that out there. So if you have thoughts, go and find them. But if you're on here as a representative of a constituency or of a group, I think it's really important that those people be reaching out to their constituencies and their groups to get feedback um, because we can't have a committee of 200, unfortunately. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who put their names in for consideration for this. And thank you to the 24 person committee members who are going to be giving up a lot of time in a very short period of time to uh, finding us some really great candidates. So thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or discussion? All right, hearing none, then we will go ahead and vote. 
All those in favor of approving the Presidential Search Advisory Committee membership and charge, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Thank you very much. Now we will take up the discussion of key presidential leadership characteristics. The themes of our September discussion on this topic are summarized in the docket. At this time, we welcome back Jim King, Christine Pendleton, and Melanie Rose from our search firm, Whit Kiefer, to help us guide us in the discussion towards the criteria we will see reflected in the position profile that will be also informed by the listening sessions. Executive Director Steves, would you like to say a, for a few words to begin the discussion? Madam Chair, members of the board, um, again, just to kind of reorient you, this, this is an opportunity for your input into the, um, the notes that are going to be developed into the position profile. You'll obviously see the profile at the end of this process again, uh, after the university community has weighed in, but this is your opportunity at the front end to offer some thoughts, offer perspectives, get, um, get some of that input, both to your colleagues who will be on the committee as well as to the search consultants. And then the university community is going to weigh in, uh, and we hope in a big way that they'll, they'll show up to listening sessions, give us lots of input and feedback that can be incorporated into that, and really really set the tone for um, what it is that this search uh, is going to be looking for in the next leader of the University of Minnesota. And so we're excited to have this follow-on discussion from your September conversation, to have, um, have a couple of our search consultants here in person and one by Zoom. And, um, and so we look for this conversation. And we've, we've actually prompted the search consultants to, to probe you a little bit, to say, you know, if you've been missing an area of discussion and they think, you know, we really would like to hear what your thoughts are on this topic or that topic, they're going to probe a little bit. And so really this is about your input into this process and, and getting your thoughts on the table. So thank you. And we'll turn it over to our, our consultants if they want to make any opening comments. Sure. Well, good morning, uh, Chair Myron and members of the Board of Regents. It's a great pleasure to be with you this morning. My name is Melody Rose, and I serve as a principal at the firm Whit Kiefer. And it's a great honor to be supporting you in this really important search. And it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss further some of the qualifications that you are expecting in, this, uh, in your new hire. It's my privilege this morning to go over with you some of the themes that we have already collected from our conversations, and I'm glad to do that. Also understanding that you have our notes from the September meeting in your docket materials, I would like just to briefly go over some of the highlights of the things that we have been consistently hearing, and these are thoughts that you expressed either in the September 8th convening of the Board of Regents or in one of the one-on-one -on -one conversations that we've been privileged to have with each and every one of you, and it's a pleasure for me to put a face to some of the names around the table of folks that I, I got to speak with. So without further ado, just a few of the themes that we've heard so far. I'd say the most compelling and consistent message that we have heard thus far is that you are an aligned and engaged Board of Regents and that you are eagerly moving forward in this process and excited to welcome your new leader. Uh, in addition to that, we hear very consistently that you are focused on continuing to elevate and communicate the university's mission, and in particular, the R1 and land grant distinctions, which are very honorable representations of the state, and that the role of the university in meeting healthcare needs of the state is exceptionally vital in the selection of your new leader. You've also acknowledged, of course, some of the challenges around national enrollment pressures and questions around the value of a college degree, coupled with a few of the local challenges related to aligning budget to needs and serving all communities equitably. And this message, again, has been consistent in your observations. 
You're also looking for a president who will be a compelling communicator and advocate among a whole variety of diverse decision makers, uh, all of whom have impact uh, on our future, our collective future. And you're looking for someone with a deep understanding of your mission, a strong academic background, and someone who has already delivered and can demonstrate delivery of positive results within a system, within talent development, budget management, and someone who comes with great personal integrity. And finally, a final theme that I've noted in our conversations is that you are expecting a forward-looking innovator and an advocate-in-chief who will unabashedly represent you in all circles. So these themes have been echoed in the Regent meetings, as I mentioned, uh, and as uh, Madam Chair indicated, you're looking to us to probe a little further. And the opening question that I would like to ask this board this morning is related to the national profile of the University of Minnesota. There was a lot of conversation last time you convened around your regional impact and the value and importance of the institution regionally, but I'd like to hear a little bit more from this group about your national ambitions. Mm -hmm. And when we think about national ambitions and a new leader at this level, one of the questions that comes to mind for me is, where do you want that person to show up on the national stage? Are there associations that are important to find representation for you? Are there places that you want to make sure that your voice is heard on a national stage? So I'll start there. Excellent question. Who would like to tackle it first? <laughs> It's an excellent question, and, <laughs> and one we need to think about. Uh, and I, yes, go ahead, Regent Davenport. Maybe, uh, thank you, Chair Mayron, maybe this is a warm up, but I think a theme that we have locally, statewide, regional, uh, extends to a national profile, and that is how we improve the lives of our citizens. Thank you, Regent Davenport. Regent Tad Johnson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and um, presenters. Um, we have many distinguished alum, uh, two vice presidents of the United States, um, several US senators and house members, and also Norman Borlaug and several Nobel laureates who have who've graduated from here. And so I think that level of academic excellence and leadership um, uh, needs to continue on, and I know we get a lot of sponsored research um, from the outside, uh, but also um, uh, the rankings of the law school and um, uh, the Humphrey School have arisen over the past few years, so, and the Carlson School, so um, that's, uh, you know, an exciting development and hope to see more in the way of national leadership in, in both, um, uh, in all fields, actually, uh, science and, and uh, others. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Johnson. Regent Gulley. Thanks. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you for both being here. Um, I, that was an interesting question because as a fairly new region, I thought, I don't even exactly know what associations and boards our president sits on, and I really should know that. So now I'm going to go back and ask <laughs> this question. Uh, <laughs> but um, what I would like to say is um, one of the things that I've thought about a lot in this position, but about the university over a long time, is that a lot of the time we have a, we have conversations about ourselves as. Um, and I hope I'm not stretching too far, but I think you know we have conversations where we're like, well, this is how it's done, this is how it's been done, this is how it's done in higher ed, this is how it's done in these kinds of institutions. We look at our, you know, peers. We have deep debates about who our peers are and what we who we want them to be. I would love to see someone who wants to really drive forward the conversation about the 
deep importance of higher ed in moving our country forward and moving our state forward and and changes this. I feel like we've been in a century of narrative or more about education being about the individual. And I'm very interested in someone who can see the collective good that we get from education and really connect it to our future and ha and and really like you know, use that to tell a story of why it matters for us as a society to invest in students who want to drive us forward and who want to, who are passionate about different kinds of things and who can take on the massive challenges that we have in front of us. I feel like as the kind of institution that we are, we are a very large land grant institution. We have deep investment from our state. We have deep commitment from people in our state. We have the opportunity to set that conversation. We don't have to wait for this to be the conversation. We can be the conversation. And I would like for us to be leaders in that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Chair. Regent Gully. Regent Hipsch. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so that's a really good question, and I, I think of uh, really three areas that that I would love to elevate our the University of Minnesota on the national level. One is in research dollars that we bring in from NIH and National Science Foundation, whatever organizations, commodity groups, wherever, uh, to get that research here, because then that's going to create the innovation and the jobs here, which. Uh, Bring me to my second point, which is our Fortune 500 companies and our startups. I mean, if, as the economic engine of the state, we have to stay relevant and innovative on the world stage. And so I think that's really important. And the third one is, uh, it appeals to me and a lot of my friends, is uh, elevating our athletics on the national level. I think it's really, it's, it's an important thing. I, I don't think we can rule it out. I think it's often been said it's the front porch to the university. and. I think a good leader attracts good coaches, and good coaches attract good uh, student athletes. And, and it's, it's a, I know every university in the United States is trying to do the same thing, so it gets tough, but uh, we have to compete on that level as well. So thank you. Thank you. I just want to echo what uh, Regent Hipsch said. It's, it's true when we think a lot of our messaging talks about what we um, contribute to the state of Minnesota. And, um, and that message obviously is very important and a president that will continue to be focused on that is important. But I think as I think about your question, I really I think about our three part mission. And I think the focus of, all, of that in terms of educating, it is true that what we are I think number one committed to doing is educating our Minnesota citizens, our Minnesota students. But then when you get to the other part of the three-part mission, research and outreach, that to me is, is, is clearly at a national stage, a worldwide stage as, in terms of the impact that we have had and that we will continue to have. So in terms of a characteristics for a future president, I want someone who is committed to that the, the, not only to the three-part mission, but uh, understanding that is, at least as to two of those three, it really has a worldwide impact or certainly nationwide impact, and we need someone who is aware of that and committed to it as well. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Regent Johnson. Yeah, uh, thank you. Regent Ruth Johnson. <laughs> Ruth, right. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to follow up on uh, something that uh, Regent Gully discussed and then raise one other thing. So uh, I think it's very important that we articulate the value of college education. I know Chancellor Carroll at uh, UMR and others have written on that and are very articulate advocates, and it would be great to see that from the, the next president. I would strongly support that. Then in terms of the national reach, there, there are different ways to do that, and I certainly agree with research and athletics. Um, but at times, the you know president of the university can be a national leader in things. And then if that's the case, and we want the president to do that, we have to support that. So there have been times, in the, for instance, in the last presidency, when the president was speaking at a national meeting and doing some of that. But then at the same time, there are always you know, local issues, community issues, safety issues, and you can't be everywhere at once. So if somebody's doing something on a national level, but then that means can't be here for a particular meeting, you know, we have to decide, are we going to support that uh, and perhaps have others 
you know, involved in leadership at that time. Does that make sense? We have to say if we want you to be a spokesperson, we have to let you go and speak at some different conferences and not use that as a criticism against you. Thank you. Any other comments on this question? All right. Other things you want to query about? Well, actually, my, my next question really is just an open-ended one. We've heard really valuable feedback from all of you already, both in public session and in our one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, so I, I don't want to repeat what we've already learned, but I would put the question to all of you if there are things that you wish to express that we have not yet heard or haven't captured or that you simply want to elevate and underscore, we really want to hear from you. Any Anything that you want us to carry forward, knowing, of course, that we're going to expand the circle of listening next week in a really powerful way. Before I um, open that for discussion, I, I I want to uh, also add to the conversation. You in the materials are, that we were provided have already. We've got an overview in terms of what you've heard and and um, opportunities, challenges, et cetera, and characteristics that you're picking up already. And and my question to you all as the experts: Are we missing anything? Are there? As we're looking, we're in a very competitive environment, and you have a much better idea of what those candidates will be interested in terms of their interests of the university. Are there characteristics or items we should at least be thinking about that should be part of the position description that we have not yet shared or in the listening sessions have not yet been shared with you? I'm all about best practices, so I want to know what what is the competition doing? What are they? What's being said out there? What do you think would be? We're missing something, and we at least ought to consider this as a characteristic. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That's an exceptional question, and uh, I would just go to my own uh, experiences and bias in answering that question, and tell you that I believe we would all agree that this is a time of tremendous ambiguity and change uh, in higher education broadly and, of course, in our civil society. And with that as a background, I think one of the key qualities that will make a president successful within that high change, um, ambiguous environment is adaptability uh, and compassion because I think that those are qualities that are somewhat intangible, and we s sometimes overlook them when we're searching uh, for a leader, but they are absolutely imperative in this moment. And so I, I think we hear strains of that in the conversations that we've heard from all of you, but I would elevate those things given the, the moment that of, of history that we're searching in. Mm -hmm. Anybody here disagree with those as potential characteristics or? Um, yes, Regent Turner. I, I was just going, thank you, Chair Miran. I was just going to thank you for answering my question before I did it. Um, because, you know, we can put together this, this litany of qualities that we want that only a super person can do. And so for you to narrow it down for me to adaptability and compassion, that is, is very, very helpful. Because we all need to do reality check. There's no one who's going to fit every single box, because um, yeah. that's just not possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now to answer your question, which is directed to have we missed anything, uh, sharing something with you, particularly seeing what you've observed so far. Let's open that up to discussion, any feedback or further input. Uh, Regent uh, Talrabi. Thank you, Chair Mehran. Um, I, I don't think this is necessarily anything new, but and I think it's been brought up before, but I think certainly somebody who's able to attract talent, um, because as a 
Regent Turner said, we're putting together a profile that's starting to look pretty impossible. <laughs> so we're not going to hire, uh, you know, perfect, but I think we want somebody that other talented people want to be around. And um, that's, that's really important. And I also think in this day and age where there's so much avenues for people to engage. I think a really um, strong relationship person, both on and off campus, is really important. Um, I, because if we don't have that ability to connect to those various um, audiences or uh, a person isn't interested in doing that, I think it will um, further sort of um, to, to the whole point about how do we retell the value of higher ed or how do we talk about all the great work that happens here um, as well as provide a, a vision for how the university is in service to um, not just the state but really the world. I mean mm -hmm. there's such incredible work here and I just um, hope that it's a person who, who really does have strong uh, relationship skills. Yeah. Along those lines picking mm -hmm. up with it uh, I know that as a search firm, this will get probed and it'll get probed by the advisory committee as well. But I imagine any candidate will look that we will look at will say, I have a great ability to attract talent or I'm a very compassionate person or I can be very adaptable <laughs> or I'm great at communicating with all sorts of constituencies. We all know that the past is the best predictor of the future, so being able to delve into and get examples from them or recommendations or references about were they really able to walk the talk in those arenas, I think will be absolutely critical. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, Chair. And I think that's part of the value that we bring to this effort is the ability to do those references on your behalf. Uh, as well as our own screenings. And we clearly also have very deep relationships with many of the people who will become your candidates and, and have experiences with them already. Great. Any other, uh, yes, uh, Regent Wheeler. Yeah, the one thing I'm, I'm wondering if at least I missed in my, first of all, appreciated very much the diligence in the one-on-one -on -one conversation, so thank you for that. Um, and that just feeds the process as we will get further fed by all the listening sessions, and that will really flesh this out well, so thank you for the process. Um, I wonder if we missed the attractors, the uniqueness of uh, this area and this campus as well as we could think, and I think of, you know, a few things come to mind, like the discovery, you know, that's been incredible here from pacemakers to honey crisp apples you know that's been incredible Doug mentioned it but fortune 500 and the corp I think Miles Shaver our professor here wrote a book about the corporate headquarters here and uh, it really is a big attractor to dual professionals um, because of all the industry here and we have the despite our winters we have the highest retention rate of any geography in the United States I mean so I wonder if we've done that in our area when we're talking about economic Academic health. Uh, we have six schools related to health professionals. There's only four universities in the country that have those. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, and that's just a smattering. I'm sure that everybody here could listen more, but I wonder if we've we've you know highlighted enough of the uniqueness of this uh, opportunity and this area for the candidates. Thank you, Regent Wheeler. And I will say one of the questions that we traditionally ask in our listening sessions is around points of pride. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a really fun part of the listening, uh, especially for me, because I'm not from here. My colleague Jim, of course, is and knows your, your state very, very well. Um, but it's always a great pleasure to hear a community talk about their points of pride. And we use those, of course, when we're speaking with candidates uh, to draw them into this opportunity. So thank you. Anything, uh, yes, Regent Gully. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And then, and and thank then you, we'll speakers. follow with Regent Farnsworth. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I wanted to just highlight a few things and, and particularly echo the things that have already been said by my colleagues, not surprisingly. Um, uh, I heard Regent Tyrabe say that they want to, that it's important to attract talent and build strong relationships. I want to echo that. I want to add that there's a lot of ego and competition. Um, those are some of our best and worst qualities as academics. <laughs> um, and I would love someone who 
who understood that, but also didn't have a lot of it and could bring that really bring that down and emphasize collaboration. We have such great interdisciplinary work happening here on campus. And I think one of the ways that um, that the incoming president could could help continue to facilitate that would be to really focus on it and really like emphasize how important it is for us to work together. Um, I would really want someone with deep respect and admiration for our staff, our faculty, um, our students. Um, uh, that includes all faculty. Um, we do, we have amazing faculty. We have amazing staff. We do a great job of highlighting the work of permanent tenure and tenure track faculty. We don't do a great job of highlighting the work of adjuncts and contingent faculty who do a lot of the teaching here at the university. And I want someone who sees that. Um, Someone who is uh, has a deep commitment to the students. Um, just sort of adding to that, you know, tuition has gone up and up and up, and that's not that's a condition of a lot of things that have happened. But someone who is really seeing the students and and looking for ways for us to balance to bring that eh, to bring that to a better place. Let's say that. Um, uh, I want us to highlight more than I love athletics too, and I've really enjoyed like spending a lot of time in the games and things. We have great things beyond athletics, though. We have excellent visual and performing arts. We have these beautiful campuses with great outdoor space. We have um, some of we have this great sustainability plan that is in action right now, and I would love for for the next person to see those as equally important to um, athletics you know, which are a huge number of our students and, and, you know, I think is a wonderful part of our campus. But, um, and then just someone who really deeply values values and sees the values that people are bringing to this campus and draws them out and is able to sort of synthesize them and find ways for folks to collaborate and, and work together to make our campuses the best that they can be. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, excellent comments by everyone so far. Agree with um, everything that's been said. I wanted to uh, pick up on something, a point you were making, Chair Mayron, about um, you know making showing action, moving beyond a demonstrated commitment to something and showing action. Uh, this is a conversation that happened in our lunch yesterday with the uh, Senate Consultative Committee uh, when we were getting feedback about you know what should the board consider as it searches for the for the university's next president. Uh, and someone at our um, the table I was at made a um, made a remark along those lines about uh, when it comes to DEI, uh, and uh, I think you know we often talk about in many different settings a demonstrated commitment to the importance of DEI. We're going to be talking about that uh, much more in depth the, from the presentation after this, which is great. Uh, but a comment that someone had made is. Uh, you know, be going above and beyond uh, more than just a demonstrated commitment to DEI to sort of start to parse out and show as a candidate um, what they've done as a track record to increase efforts around diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging um, from wherever they're coming from. Uh, and so I think the whole concept of moving from a demonstrated commitment to showing, um, giving examples and demonstrating a track record is important in a lot of different areas. And as Regent Kenyanya pointed out yesterday, sometimes it's hard to parse that out um, in an interview. And so I think other facets of the search um, you know, need to get at that as candidates progress. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure I took the note uh, very clearly yesterday and wanted to make sure to bring that to this conversation today, particularly when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging efforts uh, to really uh, look for candidates who lean into specific examples and areas they can point to of where they've uh, you know, led or collaborated with transformational leadership in those areas. So thank you. Thank you, Regent. Anything for, yes, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Regent Farnsworth and I were at the same table, so he just um, sparked that convers that great conversation we had with the, um, I think it was PNA representatives um, at our table. And, and, you know, just to add on that point, you know, what we were discussing is, um, it, it, it's hard to, it, it can be challenging 
in an interview to parse out mm -hmm. what someone's actual role was. Our university did this. That's factual. What was your role? Did you, you know, be, uh, I, I'm good at interviewing. I know the right words. You know, it's like I helped. You know, I participated. You know, so um, just to the extent that we can try to get at, um, and of course, you all know how to craft questions. I'm not going to give input on that, but I mean, I imagine that's going to be a conversation for the committee in just being a little more uh, intentional and, and targeted. Um, you know, leaders get too much blame and too much credit. Um, so, you know, when, when we're um, when we're asking these things, it's like, okay, just making sure we're not making them about the institution they come from, but about the person and, and their contributions um, to the efforts that Region Farms were talking about and, and all the other things that we're trying to, to, to inquire about. Thank you, Vice Chair Quinonia. That's helpful. Uh, Region Turner, and then I think we'll go yeah. and see if you want to probe us on other items. Yeah. Okay. I think, I'm, you know, we're obviously going to be taking candidates from all over the country. And I think it's important that they have a really good understanding of the politics in Minnesota. Um, that we, I mean, right now we have a trifecta, but um, that's not typical. And that they're going to have to maneuver between um, what appears right now, at least, to be two very different um, parties and uh, parties' agendas, et cetera. Um, and so that's going to be important for them to be able to navigate that. Yes. Because we're, we're, not, we're not supposed to represent either party here. But the reality is, is when the president goes up to the Capitol Hill, they're going to have to interact with um, both parties mm -hmm. and um, be proficient at that. It's something that I would want to see. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. We often say that when you are president of a university, you're president of a health system, and you are called upon to go talk to Congress, whether you're at the state level or the federal level, you have to be politically agnostic. You have to look at what is in the best interest of your state, your institution, right. and those you are called to serve. Great. Yeah. So we'll, we will ferret that out big time. Thank you. You're welcome. Other areas that you wish to probe us on? No, I, I think at, at this point, if if I may, I'll turn things to my colleague here to talk about next steps. Terrific. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So as we come into next week, we begin all of our listening sessions, which we're very excited to be able to embark on those. Um, as we come out of the listening sessions, we will be able to use all of that information to develop the detailed leadership profile, working with the committee and ultimately this Board of Regents to uh, have that document finalized, because that is what we will take into the market as the document that sells this incredible opportunity. Um, when we begin to finalize that document, then we'll also want to put a strategy together working with everyone that identifies um, where do we want to, as we call it, kind of network post the opportunity out in the marketplace. Um, the way we find candidates, it is, uh, it is really a joint effort with the organization that we're partnering with. So we have a very detailed database. We know every, all of the different people to reach out to, but we find taking the collective knowledge of the committee that we'll be partnering with, as well as all of you on the board, to take nominations uh, to, if there are institutions, organizations that you believe we should be reaching out to, we want to hear all of that because we follow up with every, every nomination, every lead, we follow up with all of those personally. We ultimately do want to have places where we would post, put an ad out there because um, people go and see what's happening uh, across the industry. And it is a place especially where a lot of underrepresented leaders that we're going to go after. We know places where they will go look and network and see what are the opportunities you know, that are out there uh, and so forth. This is a uh, also using our personal and professional networks. 
One of the benefits of having Melody on our team is she has been in this role before. Uh, she has an incredible network. Uh, having Zach Smith as a co-lead who came out of uh, higher education, Zach has an incredible uh, network. Uh, I've been able, along with Christine, to, to build a very deep network. So you get the network of this team, but even more importantly, the way our firm works, we're incredibly collaborative with one another. So this is a, f a search that our entire firm will be behind. We will use the brain trust of all of our colleagues in the firm to be able to network, to get access to the very best, most talented, most diverse leaders uh, for this opportunity. Uh, and then lastly, we really recommend and we will work to develop the most diverse pool possible. And we recommend allowing us to cast the widest net possible so that we can bring uh, people of color, women, incredibly strong leaders that might not be top of mind to every single person in the room. Because that's where you find great leaders. Um, and doing this work for 23 years, some of the best leaders we've had the privilege to place into roles like this, they were never looking. Their head was down, they were focused on a great job, loving what they were doing. We put the opportunity in front of them. There was something about the mission that called to them. And then we, get, we start a conversation. And we also like to work with the committee as well as the board. Uh, there might be people we're trying to get involved in this search that you would have a relationship with. And a call from one of you or somebody on the committee who has that relationship makes all the difference in the world of getting that individual to put their hat in the ring and have a conversation with us. So it's an incredibly collaborative process as we go forward. And then lastly, what I want to point out is, and I think this is going to be incredibly important as we work to build a very diverse, inclusive pool, we want to make sure that we're taking into account all of our unconscious bias. We all have them. And so it's really important as we go forward, we know the committee will be well-trained in that. All of our team is well-trained in that. But I believe approaching the way we develop the slate, understanding all of our unconscious bias, then we are able to build the most diverse, inclusive slate for the university. Uh, and then lastly, we bring a real concierge service to this. So, um, this is not a just, this isn't about just developing a, a large pool numbers for you. This is about finding the right talent, people that are genuinely interested in the University of Minnesota, in this system. And it's bringing high touch uh, and it's bringing, you know, walking shoulder to shoulder with these candidates. And really, as Melody said, you know, many of these people we already know we have relationships with. But that partnership, that relationship with the candidates is crucial. It's getting to know them, their family, uh, things that are important to a spouse or a significant other as you're recruiting to bring them to Minnesota. And so we will bring all of that to bear, but it is really an incredibly high touch. And I like the word concierge because um, it's not about a transaction. It is truly a, about building a true partnership with those leaders so that we can bring them to you and, and clearly articulate why are they interested? What are they bringing to the table for the University of Minnesota? Any questions about any of that? And then I have one more thing I'll add, Chair Mayron. Any questions here? I just have one question. Yes. Uh, as I recall in the virtual forum comments, I believe actually there was a submission of, by an individual nominating a particular individual for the uh, presidency. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, do you reach out to that, that person that they want to, they're nominating through the virtual forum or do you wait to see if that person applies or how does that work in terms of uh, as we do get communications, presumably, about you should consider this person, that person, um, to get that to you, uh, to, and then what follow-up happens after that? That's a great question. So every time someone sends us a nomination or a referral, we personally follow up with them, okay. and we let them know that they have been nominated. Uh, we present the opportunity to them. Uh, and then we ask, you know, that we'll share the leadership profile. We ask them to review it. 
and then to have a dialogue with us to figure out ultimately, are they the right type of candidate that you all are looking for? Okay. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Really appreciate your being here, walking us through the next steps, giving us feedback and allowing us to give you further feedback in terms of what comes to mind for the regions, what's important. We're gonna take a very short break uh, and be back here in five minutes and then we will uh, continue on with our agenda, which gets into diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, we're going to resume the board meeting. Um, I was reminded by uh, Regent Verhalen that our experts here from Whit Kiefer had one more issue that you wanted to raise with us or question, and then I called a break and forgot to give you the time to do that. So <laughs> I've asked you to stay around and return to the podium. Thank you. And if you want to share your re remaining thought or question with us. Thank you, Chair Mayron. I simply wanted to just underscore the, the importance of the confidentiality of this process that we'll be going through and, the, and that the work that the committee will be doing on the front end, it's so important that we just keep that confidentiality because that allows us to truly have the most inclusive process possible. I, I just wanted to remind, because I just think in these types of searches, it's just really, really important to just keep that at the forefront. Thank you for that reminder. Appreciate it. You're welcome. All right. Now we will go ahead and move on to the next topic, which are DEI system-wide initiatives for 2023-24. I'd like to invite to the presenter's table Vice President Ramirez Fernandez and Associate Vice President Keisha Varmer. Vice President Ramirez Fernandez, would you like to start us off as soon as you get situated? <laughs> Thank you. You may proceed. Good morning, Chair Mayor, and all Vice Chairs, Pip and Kenyanya, Interim President Ettinger, and members of the board. It is a pleasure to share the progress of our work at the Office for Equity and Diversity by providing system-wide support to diversity, equity, and inclusion processes for the entire University of Minnesota. Today, I am delighted to be joined by my wonderful colleague, Associate Vice President Keisha Barma, who will give a lot of information regarding the DEI Campus Climate Survey. Our remarks today are aligned with commitment four of the Impact 2025 System Strategic Plan. And in particular, we will focus on item 4.1, the retention of diverse students, faculty, and staff, as well as 4.2 action items, measure and address annual climate survey data, and develop education and training to increase intercultural competency and interactional diversity. In addition, I just wanted to um, underscore that our presentation is framed by the Cambridge Hill Partners, or as we call here, CHP, a system-wide DEI report. In October of 2021, with a focus on commitment four on community and belonging, the University of Minnesota's Office for Equity and Diversity launched an initiative to assess system-wide DEI efforts and their impact, identify challenges and opportunities, and determine the optimal structure for the Office for Equity and Diversity. Following a request for proposal process, the consultants from Cambridge Hill Partners were hired to conduct a system-wide review of the DEI work happening at the University of Minnesota. CHP conducted two rounds of interviews across all campuses, reviewed and mapped DEI initiatives to impact 2025 goals, identified strength and opportunities, and assess OED's organizational structure in the context of IMPACT 2025's goals and priorities. They found that there is a strong DEI innovation happening on all the University of Minnesota campuses, most of which has been initiated either at the campus level, school, division, department, or administrative unit. A prior survey conducted by University Relations revealed over 1,000 initiatives across the system. As an institution of higher education, it's obvious that we have a level of maturity with hundreds of individuals, you know, faculty members, staff, and students leading DEI programs and initiatives. The partnerships are strong, and they're many, and their commitment is real. While the level of effort is high, they did cite a lack of an overarching coordinating strategy that has limited the effectiveness of these efforts. They recommended that we turn our focus to strategy and alignment and also recommended that the next phase of our DEI evolution should emphasize synergy, efficiencies, sharing of DEI resources, and more importantly, the ability to measure impact. The final CHP report identified four thematic pathways, 
forward that organize their recommendations, as what you see on the slide. The purpose of these pathways is to support equity, diversity, and inclusion at the university as we strive to, for a more integrated, strategic, and system-wide approach. These pathways are strategic planning process, support of faculty and staff retention and wellness, building a coordinating infrastructure, and reorganizing the Office for Equity and Diversity. In our October 2022 presentation to the Board of Regents, that was when I was here for like five minutes, <laughs> uh, we shared, and you were all so kind and patient with me, thank you, we shared the broad overview of the ways we are moving forward in alignment with these pathways. And today, we are focusing on two of the pathways in particular, the reorganization of the Office for Equity and, and Diversity and building a coordination infrastructure. The first pathway that I will present focuses on reorganizing the Office for Equity and Diversity in order to strengthen thought leadership, increase capacity building, and system-wide consistency. This work will help us shift OED's role to focus on strategic functioning and allow us to provide a more to provide a, thought a more cohesive thought leadership and system-wide direction. In addition, it will enhance our DEI strategic planning capabilities. The second pathway focuses on building, coordinating an infrastructure. The work that is part of this pathway focuses on creating synergies and scaling up current University of Minnesota innovation, best practices, emerging practices, and expanding collaboration. It will also allow us to respond to current and growing demand by sharing resources and tapping into faculty expertise and leveraging existing diversity, equity, and inclusion groups. Very excited about this. This is our new organization chart, and this is the first time that we're sharing it. So OED is recognized for its dedication and commitment to support DEI efforts throughout the University of Minnesota system. A key theme from the CHP report is a desire for OED to play a stronger strategic leadership role across the system. And this includes assisting campuses and colleges and academic and administrative units in increasing their DEI capacity, developing strategic plans, advising on implementation, defining measures for assessing DEI programs and outcomes. The significant number of staff transitions in OED in recent years provided us with an opportunity to reconsider structural changes and with respect to the various existing positions and roles and responsibilities across the unit. So when I arrived back in last September, there were nine positions that were open and um, that we needed to consider how to fill them while being very good stewards of our fiscal resources. We spent a significant portion of 2022-23 academic year engaging in a strategic reorganization of the Office for Equity and Diversity, again, with the main goals that I stated earlier, and this organizational chart represent our reorganization effort. And here, I just want to also um, recognize our, our partners in human resources and in finance and budget who have been tremendous supporters of our work um, and have been just walking with us, you know, um, since I arrived here in, in, in September, so I want to recognize them. I want to uh, also take a moment to highlight the new sy system-wide work happening in the Office of Equity and Diversity, the education program, with Director Don, um, Dr. Collins, as an evidence of the impacts of our office reorganization. After establishing our University of Minnesota Duluth satellite program, this semester, the education program added a satellite program in, at, sorry, at the University of uh, Minnesota Morris, and we are having plans uh, for expansion to the University of uh, Minnesota Crookston um, next semester. This work has been made possible by the EOD our, um, reorganization and efforts to fully staff this program for the first time since it was established. So in the past 18 months, we were able to hire an education director, an education coordinator, and two associate directors. Uh, we used to have a tremendous weight list uh, for our programs, uh, which that was not 
a very useful uh, way of you know, increasing capacity for the members of our community. And we're delighted to let you all know that there's no wait list. You know, people mm. that are wanting to uh, participate in the programs are able to enroll and engage. During the academic year of 2022 and 2023, the, the education program taught 4,887 learners. In addition to the new staff members, we also reorganize ways that we work together with uh, our system-wide groups who are leading DEI work for the university. The diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity, we call that our DHE collective, uh, creates a space for community and collaboration among our university system-wide DEI leaders. In addition, this group has an advisory role in, advance, in advancing the University of Minnesota's diversity, inclusion, justice, and equity mission and vision. The Diversity Community of Practice, DCOP, is a system-wide grassroots community of faculty and staff from collegiate and administrative units. And their purpose is to develop and leverage personal, professional, and technical expertise and to share innovative strategies that ensure successful implementation of equity and diversity goals at the university. We held, uh, this summer, we held a planning session with our D. Um, the COP, as we call them, the Diversity of Community of Practice, leaders and conveners, and we are engaged um, to uh, for a longer strategic planning session later this semester with the goal of aligning our grassroots to our grass stops and work with other organizations doing the great work of the DEI at the university. Our newest group is the DHEAD Data Analytics Team, and that includes um, team that includes uh, faculty and grad students from the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Education and Human Development, uh, the School of Public Health, and the College of Science and Engineering. They are currently working on innovative ways to analyze DEI data so that the units are able to prioritize their actions and increase inclusivity. They will also be uh, tremendous partners um, in the analysis of the new DEI campus climate data. Yeah. <clears throat> we have also increased our administrative uh, capacity by adding two staff members. Um, John Bradshaw is our administrative assistant and strategic administrative coordinator, Kate Cl Clusterman. These positions allow us to increase our strategic functioning by arranging, organizing, and executing operational administrative duties for our office. These are amazing colleagues, and we're enjoying working with them. Uh, one of them is new to higher education, so it's really exciting to see his uh, enthusiasm for his work. I am also delighted to share that we have hired our inaugural Associate Vice President for Institutional Engagement and Education Justice. We are very grateful to Karen Diver, Senior Advisor to the President for Native American Affairs, who chaired the search. This was a national search. Um, the search committee included representation from the University of Minnesota Rochester, undergrad and grad students, administrators, and educators. This reimagined leadership position offers critical support to two priority areas, system-wide strategic planning to better align our shared strategic priorities and ensure that we're learning from each other and growing our diversity, equity, and inclusion and social justice capacities, and the direct support coaching and supervision of our critical centers and programs. There is so much to say about each one of these programs and I look forward to other opportunities to um, share uh, with you the amazing work that is taking place in each one of these spaces. But I briefly will say that given the specific and unique needs of the Circle of Indigenous Nations, the new AVP will conduct a local and national search for a dedicated director. The education program, as I mentioned briefly, which offers critical beginning as well as advanced capacity uh, building for individuals, units, and community partners, will continue to grow its curriculum and system-wide and community-facing uh, support efforts. The Gender and Sexuality Center for Queers and Trans Life will offer support, education, and services for this growing portion of our population especially in the wake of efforts to abridge transgender rights in many portions of this country and the emergence of Minnesota as a sanctuary state. 
This past year, our newly appointed director, Michael Riley, led a queer peer mentoring program to provide support to our QT students. Later in this presentation, Dr. Varma will share that the transgender <coughs> and non-binary participants' percentages are significantly lower in the student and staff populations regarding their satisfaction with campus climate. Um, MK, or the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence, led by Director Fernie Rodriguez, will continue to offer critical support for our increasingly diverse, diverse undergrad student body, a diversity that continues to outpace the, diversifi the diversification of our faculty and staff, making their holistic and culturally relevant support model all that more important for our students, for all of us. Uh, we're very excited that the Sexual Misconduct Prevention Program is launched. Um, this is a new addition to our portfolio and a continuation of the work of the Presidential Initiative for the Prevention of Sexual Misconduct, or PIPSOM as we may know it, that started at our university in 2017. And finally, the Women's Center, the first of its kind in the nation, with six decades after its founding, Director Anitra Kotelich continues to support gender equity across identities. And as AVP Keisha Varma will share in her first uh, public presentation of our campus climate data, questions on gender equity persist across our system. The work of, women, of the Women's Center remains a critical, as critical today as it was when it was created. So we are very happy, delighted uh, to introduce Dr. Melinda Lindquist, an associate professor in the Department of History and an outgoing associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion to the board and into this leadership position. She was a beneficiary of the types of centers and programs she will now supervise and support, kind of least close in the circle. And she comes uh, to us from the College of Liberal Arts where she has worked hard to build relationships across the Twin Cities campus and the broader campus system. So our reorganization included purposeful realignment for, of the organizations that support this work. Two relatively new organizations, the DHE Collective and the DHE Data Analytics Team, as described earlier, and existing organizations such as the Diversity Community of Practice and the faculty, staff, and affinity groups. We also appointed two faculty fellows to the Office for Equity and Diversity, Dr. Edgar Adriaga, who is the Northey Professor of Chemistry in the Department of Chemistry, and Dr. Melinda Linkwitz, who at the time was the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Associate Professor in CLA. These appointments are aligned with the CHP recommendation to utilize faculty to address urgent priorities. It has also been my practice to engage and elevate the scholarship and praxis of our own faculty. We're moving into the DEI um, cli campus climate survey process. Just wanted to provide a bit of context you know, for um, uh, my colleague here. A system-wide DEI campus climate survey that captures the participants' demographics, institutional commitment, equitable treatment on or around campus, satisfaction with the overall campus climate, intergroup relations and discriminations has been requested by the University of Minnesota students, has been required by our system-wide our system strategic plan or MPAC 2025, was recommended by the Association of American universities, the AAU, and by the Cambridge Hills Partners system-wide DEI um, initiative. Student representatives to the Board of Regents conducted an audit of DEI efforts and presented their findings at, their BO, uh, at the board meeting in March in, um, in Morris, in, in, Morris uh, in, in 2023. They studied these reports in detail um, and uh, they uh, found that uh, our previous student representatives in 2016 were requesting, and I'm quoting from their report, an implementation of a system-wide campus climate and an evaluation to better understand the needs of our students of color at every University of Minnesota campus. 
the system-wide DEI campus climate was extended to all students across race, ethnicity, and genders because it is important for us to understand the experiences of all of our students. In February of 2021, the Association of American uh, Universities, or the AAU, created an advisory board on racial equity in higher education. This board studies several aspects of higher education, including campus climate and community safety. And they recommended the administration of a university-wide climate, um, in other words, for students, faculty, and staff, on inclusion, safety, and other related issues and added that we need to convene campus leaders to review campus climate survey results and implement changes accordingly. Since September of 2022, there have been weekly advisory meetings with leaders from institutional research, human resources, and system leaders um, across the university. Again, I just want to thank our partners in institutional analysis and human resources and all of the leaders from um, all of the campuses at the University of Minnesota. We could not have not been able to do that without them. So it's been amazing. It's been amazing working here this past year, so just very excited. Good. Finally, the Cambridge Hills Partner System-wide DEI report in the summer of 2022 addressed the need for a system-wide campus climate survey. And now I am uh, pleased to introduce Associate Vice President, uh, Professor Keisha Varma, who has been a remarkable leader in this space and many other spaces, but particularly this is what we're gonna be talking about today, and uh, who will share additional information regarding the system-wide DEI campus climate sur um, survey. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vice President Ramirez Fernandez. As we begin to share some of the survey results, I want to emphasize that we recognize the critical need to disaggregate data in order to understand the experiences of diverse communities at the University of Minnesota. The data in the campus and unit level reports is disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. But in this presentation today, we use a collapsed version of race, ethnicity, which is abbreviated as BIPOC, meaning black, indigenous, and people of color. This category is aligned with IMPACT 2025 reporting and also reporting from other surveys and data sources on our campuses. The system-wide response rate for the DEI Campus Climate Survey is 21.8%. According to Big Ten colleagues who are administering the survey in partnership with us from Illinois and Rutgers, these response rates are as to be expected for a first campus climate survey. Within each group, it is good to see robust participation from BIPOC students, staff, and faculty. And this is a critical success for the survey in attracting interest across racial groups. The lower response rates for undergraduate students is a challenge that we plan to address so that we can be reassured that the sample is truly representative of our University of Minnesota community. So I'll begin by highlighting the findings on sense of belonging. This survey item and those I will share on the next few slides are related to our university's strategic mission to foster a welcoming community. IMPACT 2025 includes a specific commitment to increase the percentage of undergraduate students who have a favorable sense of belonging. The Campus Climate Survey expands that commitment to include our graduate students, staff, and faculty. Our goals for sense of belonging and all of the content measured in this survey are generally aligned with IMPACT 2025's goals to increase positive percentages year over year. The data on this slide is from an item that asks participants how much they agree with the statement, I feel that I belong at the University of Minnesota. What stands out? are the experiences of transgender non-binary community members and the disparities between BIPOC and white communities across all groups. Among students, it's important to know that there are at least three types of belonging that are critical and that contribute to retention, timely degree process, progress, and decreasing disparities across student experiences. These are campus community building, interpersonal <coughs> belonging, and academic belonging. Data throughout the Campus Climate Survey aligns with each of these. We also share data on belonging for faculty and staff. Staff and faculty belonging contributes to job satisfaction and also retention. 
In addition to the direct question, the survey includes items that ask about areas that are likely related to sense of belonging. The red graphics on this slide present data on the percentages of graduate and undergraduate students who agree or strongly agree that they belong in their college or department. In general, the data show that system-wide, BIPOC students are struggling to find a sense of belonging in their colleges and departments, more so than their white peers. The yellow graphics present data on the percentages of faculty and staff who agree or strongly agree that they have found communities or groups where they feel they belong. The data show that men are struggling to find communities and that, that support belonging more so than women and that the staff community is struggling most of all. These findings are related to information that was shared in the CHP report highlighting that the university has a significant number of initiatives and programs to support students, but fewer to support faculty and staff. This type of survey information increases our understanding of local experiences and can signal not only whether our communities are feeling a sense of belonging, but also indicate what actions need, where actions need to be taken. The data on this slide show the percentage of survey participants who agree or strongly agree that they are satisfied with the overall campus climate at the University of Minnesota based on their experiences in the last 12 months. For broad findings like this, further qualitative investigation is warranted. This could include formal focus groups and interviews or informal discussions. The key is to find out more about the areas of strength that should be emphasized and expanded and areas for improvement that must be addressed with more attention and resources. One point to note here and throughout this data is that this information can be viewed as a starting benchmark for our university. The high percentages of undergraduate and graduate students who agree that they are being treated with respect is especially compelling. Some of our system-wide initiatives could be contributing to these findings. Since 2018, the university has required that all employees system-wide complete an online education program related to preventing and responding to sexual misconduct. The director of the newly created <coughs> Sexual Misconduct Prevention Program, Dr. Margaret Campy, will now lead this education effort for the university. In addition, in spring 2023, all instructors system-wide were required to complete an online education program on the fundamentals of disability accommodations and inclusive course design. The Disability Resource Center on the Twin Cities campus, now led by NG Hall, and strong partnership with the provost office, created the content for this course and will administer enrollment of new instructors in the course going forward. Responses to the survey question asking participants how much they agree with the statement that the University of Minnesota has a strong commitment to DEI show disparities between BIPOC and white undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, and staff, with fewer BIPOC survey participants agreeing with this statement. The transgender non-binary participants' percentages are significantly lower in the student and staff populations. Percentages of women who agree or strongly disagree with the university's DEI commitment are also somewhat lower than men in the graduate student staff and faculty populations. Again, this type of broad information warrants further qualitative investigation into what experiences and perspectives are driving these survey responses. The responses to a question about experiences over the past 12 months show that our staff and faculty communities are working to understand issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that they are engaging in DEI conversations with their colleagues and peers. These data provide reassurance that staff and faculty are engaged in the work that will advance an inclusive and equitable campus. This is a space where we are doing well and want to continue to devote resources to support this work. The OED education team mentioned earlier is providing opportunities for faculty and staff to engage in education experiences that can foster these kinds of impactful discussions. In response to items asking students to reflect on their experiences on campus for the past 12 months, 
Both undergraduate and graduate students indicated that they feel listened to by faculty, instructors, and lecturers. New Gopher Equity Project modules are poised to further elevate this finding. They're being developed based on work led by Dr. Susanna Paleo Woodward, Director of the Duluth Office for e of Equity and Inclusion, of Diversity and Inclusion, and Duluth Vice Chancellor for Student Life and Dean of Students, Dr. Lisa Irwin. Currently, Associate Vice President, Dr. Melinda Lindquist, and OED Director of Education, Dr. Kelly Collins, are preparing to launch, launch modules that will help faculty, instructors, and lecturers build a cohesive DEI language and core DEI skills-based competencies. Additional survey responses show that UMN students from diverse backgrounds are connecting with one another. One particular question asks, during the past 12 months, how often have you interacted in a meaningful way with other people on your University of Minnesota campus? Both undergraduate and graduate students are often or very often interacting with individuals who share different race ethnicities and religious backgrounds than their own. The survey includes specific questions for faculty and staff that focus on their work-related experiences. The alignment of values with practices, especially equitable labor and compensation practices, and fair and transparent resources, resourcing are critical to retaining faculty and staff. In the survey, faculty are asked about equitable experiences related to teaching load, research, service, and compensation. Noticeably across all categories in this space, lower percentages of women report equitable experiences. This is an indication of the need for deep institutional attention and work. The trends for the staff survey responses related to fair and equitable workload, um, compensation, support, and performance evaluation are similar to those observed in the faculty data on the previous slide. This information, along with their feelings of belonging, respect, and value are useful for us to track in order for us to make sure that the university is creating an inclusive workspace where staff members can feel productive in their work and thrive in the university. It is important to recognize that the staff category is broad, and as we move forward, we must make efforts to follow up with staff across all job classes to make sure that we are hearing their voices on the ways that we can respond to these survey findings. In these final tables, the focus is on how students, in this case undergraduates, feel valued in relationships outside of the classroom. We see that across all student identities that other students play a critical role in making UMN students feel valued. The robust response rates for undergraduates regarding their classroom experience shared classroom experiences shared earlier in this presentation are a strong indicator of academic belonging. With this slide, we see that interpersonal belonging is also quite strong. A couple of data points to consider are the generally lower rates of feeling valued reported by BIPOC undergraduate students and transgender non-binary students. And the relatively higher rates across most student populations of feeling valued by our graduate student instructors. And this makes a good transition to our final set of data points on graduate students. Similar to our undergraduate students, graduate students across identity feel most valued by other students. That is, other students support the interpersonal belonging of graduate students. And whereas BIPOC undergraduates felt less valued by other students than their counterparts, among graduate students, BIPOC graduate students on our campus feel most valued by other students. It is also the case, generally speaking, that BIPOC graduate students across these assorted relationships, which support interpersonal and campus community belonging, report feeling valued by faculty, staff members, administrators, and mentors at higher rates than their counterparts. <coughs> the experiences of transgender non-binary graduate students, however, reveals a very different set of experiences. With respect to nearly every group listed, they report appreciably lower experiences of, being val of feeling valued. As we move forward, we will continue dissemination with reports going to uh, campus chancellors, 
college deans and associate deans. And then we will also conduct climate survey data analysis and focus groups with students, faculty, and staff. And now I will turn things over to Vice President Ramirez Fernandez for final remarks. Thank you, Associate Vice President Varma. Um, System-wide, the incoming fall class had the highest percentage of BIPOC students in our recorded history. Uh, from my perspective, this is such a point of distinction. Representing nearly one third of all first year students. It is exciting that our university is striving to understand the experiences of those students and our entire campus community by committing to administering this, um, this system-wide survey every other year. The data collected from the survey can be used to inform targeted interventions and improvements. It can also inspire innovation in how the university approaches DEI issues. Because we are part of a collaborative effort, we will be able to benchmark our progress against peer institutions. As uh, um, um, AVP Varma suggested, you know, we are working with other, uh, two other institutions, Rutgers and the University of Illinois. This can help identify areas where the University of Minnesota is excelling and areas where we may need to catch up. Ultimately, this DEI Campus Climate Survey is a tool for cultural change. By regularly assessing the climate and tracking progress over time, the university can work towards creating a more inclusive and equitable culture for everyone. Students, staff, and faculty are ready to learn more from the data, and our institution is committed to action. This bodes well for the future of DEI at the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much for an outstanding uh, presentation and one that um, I think every time, it, well, I shouldn't say every time because you haven't done it that frequently, but when you shine the light on this talks about how much has been done and then how much more work we need to do. Uh, to address these issues. Unfortunately, given our uh, robust schedule that we still have in place, we're only gonna have time for a few questions, and then we will need to move on to the rest of our agenda, including we have a closed meeting to conduct. So with that, um, I've got uh, questions by Regents Tad Johnson, uh, Davenport and Farnsworth, and to be frank, I think that's probably all the time we're going to have before okay. we need to move on. I'll, I'll try to make it brief, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation, and I uh, and, uh, want to say hi to my friend Keisha Varma. Uh, I had the privilege of working for the Office of Equity and Diversity, and I, everybody there was overworked, and usually the folks that come in are not happy about something, and frequently <laughs> the work that you're doing is risk management, because frequently it's, um, uh, you know, s somebody who has said something stupid in class or, you know, are, are non-politic. And um, anyway, your work is very hard. I was just very concerned about, and I'm sure you are, about the, the, the um, views of transgender gender and non-binary um, people on the campus and even administrators. And I'm just wondering what steps forward you were thinking of taking on that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, Chair Marin and uh, Regent Johnson, um, first of all, thank you for the kind words. You know, Chair Marin, I received them. They're inspiration. Um, and um, Regent Johnson, um, it is the experience of um, transgendered and non binary um, people in the world, you know, that they are under a tremendous attack. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have. A, a leader in that space, uh, as I mentioned, Director um, Michael uh, Riley, who has hit the ground running and who has been working on uh, supporting our students through various different um, ways, like um, mentoring programs, there's book club programs. Uh, Keisha and I, at one point, there was a, an open house and they brought, you know, the student affairs bunnies, you know, where you can pet a bunny. I mean, <laughs> so people just creating this sense of community um, is one of the things that we're working um, very diligently, but also partnering across the university. He has done a lot of education um, 
uh, and presentations um, to different groups in the university. Um, with, ha with the uh, hiring of AVP uh, Linguist, we hope to co better coordinate um, you know, this uh, prevention of uh, harm in this space, but also in other spaces, you know, through education, sexual misconduct, the Women's Center, and she comes with a vision, you know, to do that work that aligns with ours. So I'm really looking forward to that. But I think it is important to acknowledge that um, they have a very different experience that some of our other students have. Um, and it's probably an amazing experience compared to what other students and community members are facing in other parts of the world. But I, I appreciate that, and I hope to be able to report at some point what we're doing and how things are changing for these community members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Mayron. And mine's um, comment, comment question that maybe is not for today, but um, what struck me when I read this um, last weekend and again today as you presented is that the range of, if you call it in general, satisfaction goes from 40% to the 80% on any one of these given measures. Is there, um, what, what should we be looking for? And I appreciate that we have a year over year improvement but what should we be looking for? Should we be looking for satisfaction in the 70%, the 80%? I'm just wondering where, where are we aiming at? Mm -hmm. And it, it's different, everything's different, so I'm not expecting a surgical answer on that one. Uh, Regent Davenport, thank you for the question. Um, I will say some, um, I, I will have some remarks and then I would like for um, my colleague here, uh, AVP Varma, to um, speak about this as well. I think it provides us with the opportunity to um, continue to improve, you know, this continuous improvement. And there are certain areas that will require more attention than others, right? The experiences of certain members of our community is distinctly different from others. And uh, looking at that more uh, closely uh, with the leaders, uh, with our faculty, uh, with um, administrators, you know, what are the plans that we're planning to do that we're hoping to um, engage in? And also um, that qualitative piece that um, AVP Varma was speaking about, because these are our descriptive stats, but in what ways um, qualitative um, work can breathe some life into this numbers. And then with that, I'm going to um, allow you to continue. <laughs> Um, and yes, and I agree with those comments that we need to get more information to understand where we are, when, what that 70 or 80 percent benchmark means, and then once we have that, we could probably set more specific goals um, other than year-over-year -year improvement. But those kinds of uh, specific uh, goals and aspirations will be what we strive for as we move forward and have more data points over time. Thank you. Important work. Thank you. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Mayron, and I'll just make these as comments, um, given the interest of time, and perhaps we can per, we can follow up later. Um, two things. One, I just wanted to uh, highlight your reference to the student representatives to the Board of Regents report. I don't think those come back um, to us in conversation or presentation as much throughout the year as they should. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank you for really clearly mentioning that um, and how that's influenced your work. Uh, the second thing is, and this is definitely something I think we can connect on more later is as I was um, reviewing your presentation earlier and listening today and reflecting on a recent uh, professional ex experience I had in a different realm, uh, I'm really interested in kind of where within the OED uh, programmatic and strategic uh, atmosphere does uh, focus exist on calling folks in, you know, who may not be as comfortable with DEI work, may not understand or be as fluent uh, with how DEI work is traditionally represented in our types of atmospheres. And, you know, I think it's important. I think we all think it's important. Uh, I'm really um, excited about the work that we're doing, but there's still people, um, for whatever reason, from various backgrounds that, again, just may not be as fluent with this work, may come from different political or social or lived experiences. And where are we really um, leaning into how to talk about this 
work differently for people who come to it with various levels of understanding. So that's a very big comment. I understand that and would love to talk more about that with you later. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And I also wanted to thank you for your comments um, regarding the, um, the presidential search and the importance of DEI and having leaders that actually are able to demonstrate um, this value in their daily lives. Um, I think that um, education is a, a powerful pool, a tool. That's why we're here in higher education. Uh, and the initiatives that we highlighted um, for our faculty and staff uh, on issues um, of disability, for example, for our instructors, on a broad DEI uh, and foundational issues that uh, AVP uh, Lindquist and uh, Director Collins are developing, having those as a kind of like a primer of understanding difference, and then what are we doing next, right? Because it's uh, having your readings um, in your class and then it's the discussion, it's also the engagement with others that help you understand the experiences of um, other individuals that may be different from you. For me, it's at the relational level. So I was extremely excited to see the high uh, percentages of our the people in our community that are having conversations, meaningful conversations or meaningful interactions with each other because it's personal. You may hear, you may read things, um, you may understand things at a conceptual level, but when you have a friend that you, you know, when you have someone that you love, um, you will go the extra mile. So that's, you know, how do we then strategically and intentionally you know, coordinate those experiences without kind of like being having like social scientists that are like, you know, manipulating people, right? But, but they, you know, how do we provide those opportunities for people to be in those spaces and learn about the experiences of others and how that will enrich your life? And that is transformational. You can go back once you know certain things, you just, you just can't erase them. But I, I would look forward to that conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just make a final comment, and you touched on it, is uh, when you talked about the presidential search and how uh, we've identified in numerous constituencies already the importance of DEI and, and a president who is sensitive to that, the spouse is sensitive to and has a track record in this space. Um, interestingly, as I look at the undergraduate and graduate surveys, um, Regent uh, Johnson pointed out uh, his concern with respect to transgender and binary. What I found uh, additionally interesting is when queried about uh, they felt valued by a variety of groups, the lowest group is university administrators, um, bar none in, in terms of value. So as we are searching for our most senior administrator, um, I really think that that's gonna be an important area for us to identify, understand what uh, experience they've had, success in this area, and how are we gonna improve this uh, university-wide to increase the, uh, our appreciation or our senior administrators' appreciation of uh, undergrad and, and graduates in the space. So uh, I was really struck by that. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we could spend a day on this, uh, no or more. <laughs> so thank you very much. All right, uh, this brings us to our committee business. Uh, let's begin first with the report of the Audit and Compliance Committee. Regent Farnsworth, please share your report with us. Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Audit and Compliance Committee considered one action item this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the proposed amendments to the Office of Internal Audit Charter as amended. The proposed changes bring the charter into alignment with the amendments that were made to board policy to clarify the chief auditor's reporting structure to the board and interactions made with the president and administration. The change the committee made, which is highlighted on the page here that was passed around, was to clarify that the chief auditor may participate on the president's cabinet instead of formally serving on it. Chair Mayron, I move approval of the proposed amendments to the Office of Internal Audit Charter <laughs> as amended. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I do have one question. I'm looking at the, the sheet um, that you provided to us was handed out. And the language that apparently was amended from the materials to what's before us changes the word serving to participating. And I'm wondering if you could 
uh, explain to us um, why that change was made, what was sought to be accomplished. Uh, I'd also note that under a separate policy, uh, which we took up actually um, in the governance committee at section five on delegation of authority, this is a board of regent policy, that policy uses the word serving. So, uh, so th it's not consistent right now, but more importantly, that can be addressed. It's understanding the need to change serving to participating. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I may um, call on uh, Regent Gully actually proposed this amendment in the committee. So if it would be okay for her to make that explanation and I'll certainly follow up um, thank to you. provide any more information. Thank you. Sure, of course, I'd be happy to, and I will try to keep it brief. Um, we had a robust discussion about the uh, importance of um, the chief auditor being an independent person in the university who can uh, look at things from the outside and, and be very impartial. Um, and while we strongly believe that our current chief auditor is an impartial person and it's important for him to be in our and to be attentive to things that are happening in the cabinet meeting. Uh, it felt like an important distinction to say he is not part of the cabinet, but is serving the cabinet and is supporting it, um, but as an independent um, observer. And so, you know, we were, uh, we've talked, in fact, like in the committee, we talked quite a bit about the pros and cons and about the, the different ways that this could play out. Um, and would be happy to continue the conversation over years, but felt that it was a really important message to our community that our chief auditor is an independent um, uh, observer of all things that are happening in the university. Thank you. Uh, yes, Regent Farnsworth. Then Chair Mayron, just to quickly address your second point about the policy discrepancy. Um, yes, there is the reference now um, that needs to be corrected in the reservation and delegation of authority policy. Um, I've been told that um, now that you know we've made this change, um, board staff and, and others will then look to make sure that that is consistent, um, of course, pending um, the passage of this today out of the board. My, thank you. My follow-up question is, um, and I know he's here in the audience, but I don't know if um, our chief auditor Galswick did speak to this, whether he was in favor, opposed, or agnostic about it, uh, but I would be interested if you could share any feedback that he gave to you as to what this change might mean. You know, I, I'm hesitant to characterize his exact comments. He's here, um, if he would <laughs> like to. If, if, the, if it's the chair's interest to hear from him, I would prefer to have his comments coming from him than me try to characterize it. All right, Chief Auditor Quinn, if you could come up. Thank you, sorry to put you on the spot. It's okay. All right, thank you, Chair Mayron. So uh, in regards to the change, I felt the specific amendment of switching from serving to participating wouldn't um, materially impact my ability to continue to provide advice to the uh, president's cabinet and to be able to um, continue to gather the information that I think is so critical for me to do my job effectively. Uh, if the audit committee and the board believes that the word serving would be a little bit more problematic than the word participating for our community to understand what my role is like, I'm comfortable with that change of that particular word. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? All right, all those in favor of the proposed uh, amendment to the charter for the Audit and Compliance Committee, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Auditor Quinn. All right, uh, Regent Farnsworth, uh, any other uh, business to bring to our attention? Yes, I'll wrap up the end of the report. Uh, in addition to the action item and information items, the committee discussed three items. First, the committee heard an overview of the process we will use to review the annual financial statements of the university. The final FY 2023 financial statements will come to the Audit and Compliance Committee in December. The committee then reviewed an update on the safety training process being implemented by University Health, Safety, and Risk Management. The item gave us a valuable look into this important function and the work being done to create a central safety training resource. For our final discussion item, Chief Auditor Galsbrook provided the committee with an internal audit update. 
reporting that 38% of the outstanding recommendations rated as essential were resolved by university departments. This is slightly lower than the expected implementation rate of 40%, but a slight increase from last June's 35% rate. The next update will come in February. Finally, the committee received an information item related to an engagement of less than $100,000 with an external audit firm required after the fact, requiring after the fact reporting. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. <laughs> At this time, uh, we're going to move to the Mission Fulfillment Committee report. I will note that with the change to board policy that we adopted in September, both Mission Fulfillment and Finance and Operation Committees are now delegated authority to act on behalf of the board. Given that change, the committee reports for those committees will simply note the items that were approved and those items will then be recorded in the board minutes. Uh, with that, uh, Regent Ruth Johnson, could you please provide the report for Mission Fulfillment? Yes, thank you, Chair Mayron. The Mission Fulfillment Committee approved two action items this month. First, amendments to the Board of Regents policy student education records as amended. And then secondly, the consent report, which includes academic program changes and conferral of tenure. There Thank were no other action items approved this month. Thank you, Chair Mayron, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Regent Johnson. For Finance and Operations Committee, Regent Hipsch, if you could report, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Mayron. The Finance and Operations Committee approved four items on behalf of the board this month. Though I, those items are the resolution related to the 2023 six-year capital plan and the resolution related to the 2024 state capital request. The resolution related to the supplemental fiscal year 2025 budget request to the state of Minnesota the Duluth Campus Plan, and the Consent Report. There are no other action items approved this month. Thank you, Chair Mayron. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Hipsch. For Governance and Policy, Regent Verhalen, if you could provide your report, please. The Governance and Policy Committee did not consider any action items this month, but the committee did take up two discussion items. The first discussion provided the committee with an overview of Board of Regents policy, reservation, and delegation of authority. The policy is currently under comprehensive review, and this discussion starts a four-part series to consider any changes the board may, mish, may wish to make. The agenda item outlined how the policy is structured, the types of authorities defined within it, and the current thresholds. In December, the committee will look at peer data and best practices to start to consider potential changes. The second item continued our discussion of the board's committee structure. The discussion focused on our current standing committee structure and the charges for each committee. Regents gave feedback on those portfolios, potential gaps, and what information will be helpful as we consider our committee structure. The next conversation in December will focus on the role of standing committees and special committees. Thank you, Chair Mayron. This concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, before we move to the uh, next uh, committee reports of our special committees, let me again just remind my colleagues for those of you who don't attend uh, because uh, the other a committee, because you're in another committee, uh, again, I urge you to make sure you're reviewing those materials and also take advantage of listening or watching the video of those meetings. Getting your input, making sure that you are being brought up to speed is very important to all of us. Uh, ultimately, they, these issues will come to you as an entire board, but getting your input along the way is critically important to the process. Thank you. And now turning to our special committees, we'll start with the Special Committee on Academic Health. Regent Wheeler, would you share your report? Yeah, thank you, Chair Mayron. Uh, special Committee on Academic Health considered one action item this month. The Special Committee voted unanimously to approve the academic affiliation agreement with CentraCare. This agreement will create a regional campus of the medical school uh, with CentraCare at, at CentraCare to improve access and high quality care to rural Minnesota. Affiliation will also create uh, centric care sponsored residencies and a co-led research institute to focus on rural health challenges. Today's action to approve is the affiliation agreement. After today, the board will have the ability to review and act on a final financial plan. If that financial plan were not accepted by the board, the affiliation agreement would be terminated. We want to make sure that this is a sustainable endeavor for, uh, for all served. 
The special committee uh, received a preview of that financial plan and feels confident it's moving in the right direction. By approving the affiliation agreement now, medical school and center care can start to move forward uh, toward accreditation and admitting the first class of students in the fall of 2025. With that context, Chair Mayor, and I move, I, I move approval of the academic affiliation agreement with Center Care. Is there a second? Second. second. And to remind committee or the regents here, uh, that affiliation agreement was attached to the materials that were part of the docket uh, for all of your review. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, uh, then all those in favor of approving the academic affiliation agreement with Center Care, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion is approved. Regent Wheeler, any other committee business? Yeah, just a few other things to report. The, it also included our work plan for the year. I encourage you to take a look at the topics that we're um, proposing taking up and share your thoughts with, with either uh, me or with Vice Chair uh, Ruth Johnson. Um, we also heard a high-level overview of the M Health Fairview relationship. Vice President Toller uh, reviewed the current structure as well as its successes and challenges. The overview provided the special committee with the foundation for the upcoming discussions on the next steps for the university's clinical mission. Finally, um, Interim Chair, uh, Interim President um, Edinger and Vice President Toller and myself free provided special committee with an update on the Governor's Task Force on Academic Health at the University. And the spe special committee will continue to watch the work for the task force and seek ways that we can provide input into that work. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Mayra. Thank you very much, Regent Wheeler. <coughs> Finally, the Special Committee on University Relations Regent Talrabi, if you could provide your report. Sure. Thank you, Chair Mayron. The Special Committee on University Relations did not consider any action items this month. The Special Committee started our second meeting by reviewing our work plan for the year. For our second item, Executive Director Lopez Frenzen provided update on the vision for government and community relations at the university, while also providing the special committee with the opportunity to provide input regarding the proposed vision. Finally, Executive Director Lo Lopez Frenzen shared an update on the upcoming work of government relations at the state, federal, and local levels and the legislative process and timeline and strategy behind the work to support the university's requests. It was very important. I hope that you all have a, uh, when, if you have an opportunity to listen to, to her presentation. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Mayron. Thank you, Regent Tarabi. That concludes our committee reports and brings us to old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, at this time we will consider a resolution to close the rest of the meeting in order to discuss matters of attorney-client privilege with counsel. Mr. Steves, will you read the resolution? Regents of the University of Minnesota resolution to conduct non-public meeting of the Board of Regents to discuss attorney-client privileged matters. Whereas based on advice of the General Counsel, the Board of Regents have balanced the purposes served by the open meeting law and by the attorney-client privilege and determined that there is a need for absolute confidentiality to discuss litigation strategy and particular matters involving the University of Minnesota. Now, therefore, be it resolved that in accordance with Minnesota Statutes 13D.01, Subdivision 3, and 13D.05, Subdivision 3B, a non-public meeting of the Board of Regents be held on Friday, October 13th, 2023, in the boardroom, 600 McNamara Alumni Center, for the purpose of an attorney-client privilege discussion of litigation relating to a data security incident, including the following. Lindsay v. University of Minnesota, Eckel v. University of Minnesota, Shackelford v. University of Minnesota, <coughs> Ditburner v. University of Minnesota, Martin v. University of Minnesota, Severson v. University of Minnesota, Foster v. University of Minnesota, and Chatelaine v. University of Minnesota. Is there a motion to uh, adopt the resolution? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is approved. At this time, we're going to take a short recess to end the live stream and allow those in the boardroom to leave. 
we will have a very short recess at which time we would ask that board members uh, go into the room behind us, grab your lunch, come back here, and you will be able to eat your lunch while we are conducting our uh, attorney-client privilege meeting. Thank you.